so just a reminder, these are the um, main topics that you're going to see on the exam. Um, hold on, some people entered the waiting room. Okay, so this um, unit is going to fall mostly under um, computer systems and networks here. So that's a pretty good um, chunk of the material. This is computer networks. Um, so the first thing that you have to know on the exam about the internet is like what it's made up of. So the internet is basically just a massive network of routers um, or as like the exam sometimes refers it to like a big network of networks. Um, basically a router is just a device that like can communicate with other devices. So in this picture, you can see like each of these little cylinder things are routers and they could connect with each other through these um, lines that show it. And then they could um, exchange information between each other. And you guys probably have like a Wi-Fi router in your house. So you, you guys have these, like these are all routers. Um, okay. And a computer network allows one device to communicate with another device. Um, so in this picture here, this would be an example of a network. These devices can communicate with each other. Um, LAN, you might see on the exam, but it's not really like super important, um, but it's just something you should just know, I guess. Um, it stands for local area network, and it's just a network in a limited area. So for example, like a network in your school or in like an office or your house, um, it's not like the whole world network. Um, and each network is called a host. Um, information is set in packets, which are just like information that's broken apart into smaller sections and we call those sections packets, um, which is important when we learn about how this information is being sent, which we'll talk about in like two minutes, I don't know. Um, and then each router individually decides where each packet goes. So you might think like um, if you needed, if you needed um, information to go from this first router to this router, um, the path might be predetermined by this router. Like um, this router is gonna First, send it to here, then to here, then to here, then to here. But no, um, the, one router decides where it's going to go next, and then the next router decides where it's going to go next. And it, like, it all just depends on whatever's available, because a lot of times um, these things break down or like there's issues. So each router individually moves the information, the packets. Okay. Um, routing again, it's just the process of finding a path from a sender to the receiver. So that um here in this picture, you could see this path might be this, or it could might it could go through a different path. It could go um to this router up here and then here and then here and then here. Um, it all depends and it changes. My okay, bandwidth is the maximum amount of data that can be sent in a certain amount of time, and this is usually just measured in bits per second. So basically, all you have to know is the higher bandwidth, it's the more information you can send in amount of time, which means that it's faster, obviously, and it has more capacity. And a lower bandwidth is slower because there's less information you could send um, at a time, and this means there's less capacity. And I'll post these slides on Google Classroom, so don't worry about it. Okay, um, internet versus World Wide Web. This is something they ask you like on the exam, I think. And a lot of the times on practice exams, this will show up. I think there was like one question like this, but basically all you have to know um, in terms of like the difference between the two is that the World Wide Web is based on the internet. Usually people think the World Wide Web and the internet is the same thing. And usually people like refer to it as the same thing, but technically if like you really want to be specific, they're different. So the World Wide Web is basically a collection of um, websites and like documents um, that you could view on a web browser, right? So this is like, um, like the actual things on the internet. The internet is the network themselves, like the the network of routers and stuff we were talking about. So essentially the World Wide Web is a collection of uh, information that's accessed through the internet. So the World Wide Web depends on the internet. It's built um, on top of the internet. Um, yeah. All right, and then, do you guys have any questions so far? Oh, 
Okay. Um, so another part of computer networks that you have to know on the exam are like all the different protocols that computers use. Um, you don't have to like per se memorize all of them, but you just have to know what they are and like their general purpose. So um, here's like a good visualization of the layers of um, the protocols, like their hierarchy, I guess, because um, some are built on top of others. So first thing you have to know is the internet is open source. No one, one person or group owns it. Um, if the government doesn't own it or like, it's not like one person created the internet and then like has the rights to it, it's open source. So it's built on open source technologies and uses standard protocols, which are these protocols here and that we'll learn about in like a few minutes. Um, so every device that's connected to the internet must use these protocols. These are standard. It doesn't doesn't matter if you're using an Apple or an Android, like you have to use these protocols because um, that's how the devices like communicate with each other. OK, so the first oops, the first layer would be the physical layer, which is like the hardware, the physical wires and cables that the information. Sorry, the information is all sent through. Um, that's pretty easy to remember because like it's not anything too technical. Okay. Next, um, as you can see, like next on the hierarchy is IP, which stands for Internet Protocol. Um, and every device connected to an Internet has to have an IP address. This is basically just a set of rules of how information is set on the Internet. So an IP address is like a unique number that identifies a device. And this changes. Um, they're... Um, most of the time they change, but like static IP addresses don't change, but dynamic IP addresses change depending on the network that you're assigned to. You don't have to know that for the exam, but um, you just have to know that an IP address is a unique number um, as shown in this picture, like that identifies devices and every device that's connected to the internet has to have an IP address so that it can be um, identified. So you, um, it knows like who's sending things to who if that makes sense. Um, so you can see here, this is the old IP address format. Right now we're switching from IPv4 to IPv6. Um, basically, IPv6 is just longer, it has more bits because there's so many more people joining the internet, obviously. So now we need more unique numbers to identify all the unique devices. Um, so you can see here, there's 32 bits and those identify devices. Okay, the next protocol that's built on top of IP um, is TCP and UDP. And these are just how um, information is sent. So TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and it's more accurate but slower than UDP. So basically how TCP works is that um, it numbers each packet and before sending them. And then as they're being sent, you're checking like um, between the sender and receiver, they're checking that like it's in the right order and everything is being sent and they didn't miss any packets. Um, and then when they're all sent, a return receipt is sent to so just check like everything's in the right order and everything's there. So that's why it's slower because it has to like have these checks back and forth um, to make sure everything's right. Um, and then UDP is less accurate and faster. The packets are not ordered. They're just like sent as quick as possible. So um, a good like analogy to think of this for is like if you're organizing a library, if you want it to be all like neat and nice um, and easy to find books with, you could organize it all nicely based on like the author's last name or in a certain order or alphabetically or anything like that. But this takes longer, but it's also more accurate. Or you could just like shove all the books onto the shelves in no particular order, but it takes less time, but it's like less organized um usually tcp is used for things that like have to be more accurate but like udp could be used for like zoom calls for example like if they're like glitching out and like i'm lagging behind or something like that that's probably why because like you just need to make sure like that i'm like they just have to make sure that you can like understand me like everything's moving at the same time and like the audio is coming through so like you can't really 
spare any time so they have to ha make it faster so when things have to be faster people will use or companies will use UDP okay again as you can see this is just a visualization so um, UDP it just gets sent um, TCP there's like multiple times where it has to be checked back and forth okay does anybody have any questions so far Okay. Um, I'm actually moving pretty fast, so we might end early. Okay. Um, another protocol. Um, this isn't really as important as other ones, but it's still good to know. Um, are HTTP and HTML. So HTML is just stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and it's just used to display your browsers to display like. Um like different images or whatever on like a certain website or whatever. Um, HTTPS is hypertext transfer protocol. And sometimes it, um, if you like look at the top of your URL, oops, like you can see it says HTTPS. The S just stands for secure. Um, this is used by the World Wide Web and it this encodes and transports, transports information to load and interpret web, web pages. So these are like get requests and post requests. So it's getting um like a certain image or text or whatever, and then showing it on the screen. Um, and then with the S just means the information is encrypted. So that's why it's called secure. And then we're just gonna watch, oops, a quick video on this. Can you guys hear this? I'm Jasmine Lawrence, and I'm a program manager on the Xbox One engineering team. One of our biggest features is called Xbox Live. It's an online service that connects gamers from all around the world, and we rely on the internet to make that happen. This is no easy task, and there are a lot of things happening behind the scenes. The internet is totally changing how people interact and connect, but how does it work? How do the computers all across the world actually communicate with each other? Let's look at web browsing. First, you open a web browser. It's the app you use to access the web pages. Next, you type in the web address or URL, which stands for Uniform Resource Locator of the website you wanna visit, like tumblr.com. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Karp, the founder of Tumblr, and we're here today to talk about how those web browsers we use every day actually work. So you've probably wondered what actually happens when you type an address into your web browser and then hit enter. And it really is about as crazy as you can imagine. So in that moment, your computer starts talking to another computer called a server that's usually thousands of miles away. And in milliseconds, your computer asks that server for a website and that server starts to talk back to your computer in a language called HTTP. And HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And you can kind of think of it as a language that one computer uses to ask another computer for a document. Uh, and it's actually really pretty straightforward. If you were to intercept the conversation between your computer and a web server on the internet, it's mainly made up of something called get requests. And those are really very simply the word get and then the name of the document that you're requesting. So if you're trying to log into Tumblr and load our login page, all you're doing is sending a GET request to Tumblr's server that says GET slash login. And that tells Tumblr server that you want all of the HTML code for the Tumblr login page. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And you can think of that as the language that you use to tell a web browser how to make a page look. So if you think about something like Wikipedia, which is really just a big, simple document, and HTML is the language that you use to make that title big and bold, to make the font the right font, to link certain text to certain other pages, to make some text bold, to make some text italic, to put an image in the middle of the page, to align the image to the right, to align the image to the left. The text of a web page is included directly in the HTML, but other parts, images or videos, are separate files with their own URLs that need to be requested. 
the browser sends separate HTTP requests for each of these and displays them as they arrive. If a web page has a lot of different images, each of them causes a separate HTTP request and the page loads slower. Now, sometimes when you browse the web, you're not just requesting pages with GET requests. Sometimes you send information, like when you fill out a form or type a search query. Your browser sends this information in plain text to the web server using an HTTP POST request. So let's say you log into Tumblr. Well, the first thing you do is you make a POST request. That is a POST to Tumblr's login page that has some data attached to it. It has your email address. It has your password. That goes to Tumblr server. Tumblr server figures out that, OK, you're David. It sends a web page back to your browser that says, success, logged in as David. But along with that web page, it also attaches a little bit of invisible cookie data that your browser sees and knows to save. And that's really important because it's really the only way that a website can remember who you are. And all that cookie data really is is a, an ID card for Tumblr. It's an, a number that identifies you as David. And your web browser holds on to that number. And then the next time you refresh Tumblr, the next time you go to tumblr.com, your web browser knows to automatically attach that ID number with the request that it sends over to Tumblr server. So now Tumblr server sees the request coming from your browser, sees the ID number, and knows, OK, this is a request from David. Now, the internet is completely open. All of its connections are shared, and information is sent in plain text. This makes it possible for hackers to snoop on any personal information that you send over the internet. But safe websites prevent this by asking your web browser to communicate on a secure channel using something called Secure Sockets Layer and its successor, Transport Layer Security. You can think of SSL and TLS as a layer of security wrapped around your communications to protect them from snooping or tampering. SSL and TLS are active when you see the little lock that appears in your browser address bar next to the HTTPS. The HTTPS protocols ensure that your HTTP requests are secure and protected. When a website asks your browser to engage in a secure connection, it first provides a digital certificate which is like an official ID card, proving that it's the website it claims to be. Digital certificates are published by certificate authorities, which are trusted entities that verify the identities of websites and issue certificates for them, just like a government can issue IDs or passports. Now, if a website tries to start a secure connection without a properly issued digital certificate, your browser will warn you. That's the basics of web browsing, the part of the internet we see day to day. To summarize, HTTP and DNS manage the sending and receiving of HTML, media files, or anything on the web. What makes this possible under the hood are TCP IP and router networks that break down and transport information in small packets. Those packets themselves are made up of binary, Sequences of ones and zeros that are physically sent through electric wires, fiber optic cables, and wireless networks. Fortunately, once you've learned how one layer of the internet works, you can rely on it without remembering all the details. And we can trust that all those layers will work together to successfully deliver information at scale and with reliability. Okay. Okay, so now let's start. Um, they mentioned some protocols that we'll, we haven't gone over yet, but I'm going to go over them now. So if you guys had questions, hopefully they'll be answered. All right. The next protocol um, we'll go over is DNS, which is up here on the last layer. Um, so DNS means stands for the domain name system. It's basically just a huge address book of the internet's website names and their corresponding IP addresses. So like if you want to go on Google, like instead of having to know the IP address, um, your computer stores it through 
DNS. Um, CLS is transport layer security, transport layer security, and it's just um a cryptographic tool designed to protect communication on the internet. It basically just um protects information from like hackers. Um. Next, an important aspect of the internet is scalability. So, um, as you can see on this graph, the internet is expanding a lot, like super quickly. A lot of new people are joining. Um, so how is the internet able to support all these people? Um, the internet was built to be scalable. So scalability is basically a system's capacity to change in the size in size to meet new demands. So the internet's able to um meet this demand of new people without like breaking down or crashing. Um, so that's why it's so important because as more and more people join the internet, we want to make sure that internet is still working and it doesn't like break down. Um, so yeah, you have to know that the internet is scalable. Okay, another important aspect of the internet is its fault tolerance and its redundancy. So um, you can see in this picture, um, in the first um, network where there's blue dots, um, if the middle dot breaks down or like gets lost, the whole thing breaks down. Like these other dots won't be able to, these other um, no, uh, routers, sorry, won't be able to communicate with each other if that just one router breaks down. So we don't want that to happen, right? We want um, there to be a lot of different paths just in case like something breaks down, which is more often than you think. So something a little better would be these red routers, um, but it's still like not all connected. And the best would be these yellow routers where everything's um distributed so the internet is a distributed network it's not centralized like this so there's multiple connections that don't just rely on a single point like here um so these are called redundant connections like when there's more than necessarily needed but like it's just in case right um so if a few connections fail it could still work and connections fail a lot more than you think so it could be um due to like hardware failure operational failure like weather animals or cyber attacks or anything like that like for the wires that are connecting different like continents like underneath the ocean like maybe like a fish or like a huge shark like broke it like you know it's a lot more common than you think so just in case anything like that happens we have a lot of redundant um routers um, a router will send the packets in a different path if one router fails. So like we were saying before, each router individually decides where each packet goes. So there's not a set path um, for packets. Um, each router decides where it goes. So like if one router is broken, it's like, oh, okay, instead of going um, to that router, it can go to that router because we have so many redundant connections. Um, which is important because you want to make sure things work even if a few a couple connections break. Um, and a fault tolerance just means the ability to withstand problems. So basically, fault tolerance and redundancy um, go hand in hand. So the internet is fault tolerant because of its redundancy. The internet is able to withstand problems because of how many um, extra connections, I guess, it has. Okay, so you could see here, um, this model is obviously better than the bottom one because there's a lot of extra connections in case something breaks. But here, if if this one router on the left breaks, um, all these routers cannot connect or communicate with each other. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far? Because I know I went through a lot. Okay. All right, so the next topic we're going to discuss is parallel and distributed computing. And so usually computers complete stuff step by step, right? Which takes a long time. So you can see on this the right here, if you have multiple tasks and they're being done like sequentially, just one by one, it takes a lot a lot of time. But parallel and distributed computing can speed up these processes by having multiple processors. So 
Um, parallel and distributed computing is kind of similar, but we'll explain the differences in a second. So parallel computing is basically having each task broken down into smaller operations, so they're just being split. And then it uses multiple processors within one computer at the same time. So processors have shared memory to exchange the information. So you can see um, in this picture on the right, or on the le left, sorry, um, you have all these tasks that are being broken down and they're both be they're all being put into separate processors that are running at the same time so that you could kind of multitask. Um, the more processors are used, the faster it will be up until a certain point. So if you use like, obviously if you use two processors, it'll be faster than five, but at a certain point, it doesn't really make a big difference if you use five or, I mean, if you use like five or six or seven, because like, there's some tasks you can't run at the same time. Some tasks you have to run before others. Um, so because of that, there's there's a point where like the speed up plateaus. Um, that's the speed up limit. So okay, the next thing you have to know how to calculate is the speed up, which is basically the amount of time something takes do uh sequentially just doing like one by one at a time divided by the amount of time it takes doing about the amount of time it takes running parallel so if sequentially it took six minutes to run but having multiple processors doing parallel computing it took two minutes then the speed up would be three and here's the graph that kind of shows how um the speed up kind of plateaus up till a certain point. So here around like 550, um, the speed up like stops having a large, the number of processors stop having a large effect on the speed up. Okay, it's the last slide already, okay. Um, so the difference between distributed computing and parallel computing is that distributed computing uses multiple devices to run a single program rather than multiple processors. And the difference is that each processor has a private memory, so they can't sh exchange information, whereas in uh, parallel computing, the processors have a shared memory, so they could exchange information between each other. So, like, these are run on different computers rather than different processors on the same computer. Um, okay. So, um, let me try to draw this out, hold on. Okay, so in order to calculate the amount of time a program would take, sequential, you basically just sum up all the steps. So if step number one took, let's name these steps. Um, if, addition, this step is called addition, this step takes four minutes. This step is called multiplication. And it takes um, five minutes. And this step is called division. And it takes four minutes. Sequentially, you just add these up. So four plus five plus four is 13. So that's the amount of time it would take. For parallel computing, oh my God, okay. for parallel computing, it takes as long as the longest time on one processor. So what does that mean? If you have two processors, you can group um, addition and division together on one. So that'd be four and four, which is eight, right? And then multiplication on another, which is five. So that total would be five. Since these are running at the same time, um, the amount of time is just, would just be eight because um, since they're running at the same time, five would be done um when this is at five and then they would just ha have to wait for like three more minutes for both of them to be done so in total it would just be eight minutes since they're running at the same time um so compare this to the sequential time which is 13 minutes to calculate the speed up it would be 13 
divided by eight. Okay. Um, let me see if, let me look at the practice problems. Okay, does anybody have any questions? All right, I'm going to post. All right, thank you for responding. Um, I'm going to post the worksheet on Classroom, and then we're going to start it now. And you guys can look through it and just let me know if you have any questions. Um, Wait, what do you mean by worksheet? Hmm? What Sorry. What you about sheet? Oh, we, we just have, like, a worksheet with, like, practice problems of what we just did, like we did last week with Unit 1. Okay, you guys should see it on Google Classroom now. And I'm going to share my screen and go over some problems. And then the rest you guys can do for homework. Wait, actually, I'm going to change the due date. Originally, we were supposed to do this in class on Thursday. But since we were done early, um, we're ahead. So I'm going to just change this due date to next Tuesday because that's when it was originally due. Wait, so like, how do I send the answers? So on Google Classroom, you should be able to click on the assignment and like edit it. And then once you're done, you could press turn in. Are you in the classroom? Yeah, I'm in um, the quiz. Okay, so you should be able to see it. I just posted it like one minute ago. Um. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen, and we're going to go over some of them. But this first question, you guys should be able to figure out. It's literally on the slides. Um, This next one, we can do together. So, um, in the diagram below, what is the minimum number of routers that must be broken in order for information to not be able to be sent between New York and o Oakland? So, Oakland is here. New York is here. Um. how many routers would have to be broken in order for information to not be sent? Like, what's the smallest number of routers? So you guys can, like, look at each um, router and see, like, oh, if Austin was broken, would they be able to communicate? If Oakland was broken, would they be able to communicate? Like, this connection between Austin and Oakland was broken, would they be able to communicate? Um, if the one between Austin and Tampa was broken, would they be able to communicate? And then see the if they're um able to communicate in the least amount of broken routers so um if you look at this you could see like if this connection was broken if, um they wouldn't be able to communicate so the answer would be a one okay um Do you guys have any problems you want to do in class right now? Because we're going to do this next class too, so. Hey, um, um, number one. This one? 
Um, wait, I'm gonna send my answer to um to the chat private privately to you because okay. I'm not. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Is it okay if I explain it like in front of everybody though? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, hold on. Okay, so we went over the, um this problem in the slides. Um, so basically, I said the World Wide Web is like websites and documents. Um, and you can view world those stuff on the World Wide Web through the internet, which is like the connections of the routers. So um like i said the world wide web depends on the internet the world wide web runs on top of the internet um so the answer here should be um c the world wide web is a series of interconnected web pages that run on the internet so yeah do you have any questions about that Okay, why don't you guys just work on this worksheet, and then if there's any problems, you could let